Okay. Well, this is round two, actually. Welcome, <laughs> Darren Eggleton. <Yeah. laughs> uh, I'm super excited, buddy, to have you today as a guest on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Welcome, bud. Thank you very much. Awesome to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no worries, man. I, we, we were literally t- chatting. We were like five minutes into the chat, and um, I just heard this like sound on my side. I just went, and then like everything switched off, and I was like, oh no! <laughs> I thought, I thought yeah, all the power gone. had gone off. Yes, it's, um, it's yeah. uh, honestly that's never happened. So, so it's kind of crazy. Um, but but we were busy saying like it's been twenty five years, but since uh, we finished high school and. It kind of feels like yesterday, yeah. but it also feels like ages ago. Yeah, definitely it does. I mean, it's so much has happened in between that time, isn't it? Like it's it's literally a lifetime ago. Yeah, it is, man. Um, and I don't know, like I've been like I think we were lucky at, at school. We had a great group of friends and a great year. And um, I don't know, I just had a great experience at school and like I'm still in contact with with quite a few people. And I just, yeah, I just feel like we were lucky if I speak to other people about their school days and stuff, it doesn't necessarily feel the same or sound the same. Yeah, no, I mean, I look back at our time at school. I mean, I agree with you. I think we did have a lovely, like, a group, the group that we they graduated with. Um, yeah, it was just lovely people. I, I don't have any bad memories of it at all. I never think back and think, oh, I wish this didn't happen. I wish that didn't happen. To me, it's been all, it's good memories. Yeah, absolutely, bud. Um, I think you're about like the the fourth or or maybe fifth guy like from school that's actually come on the podcast now, and and I just think it's so awesome. Like, I like I love sharing in my friend's success. You know, like I think people yeah. don't do that enough. You know, like everyone seems to kind of be like in their own like like let's just go 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 and like make money, make money, and make money and do well and blah blah blah. But but actually, I think there's a lot of enjoyment in in sharing in other people's success. Um, and you, bud, are, wow, you've raised the bar. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I really appreciate that. It's yeah. been many, many hours of painting, long, long hours, many yeah. years, I suppose. Yeah, well, you you yeah. are like I'm, I almost feel like I'm I'm chatting to sort of like Picasso here, but so <laughs> <laughs> so I appreciate that, man. Yeah, man. So listen, um, yeah. you know, you were you were actually quite a rebel at school, but from from memory, and um, yeah. you you yeah, but but you were always like a a really talented artist. Is that something that like just sort of came naturally to you? Yeah, it's just I've always been able to paint. So for me. When I was younger, like we used to go on trips into the bush, like every South African family does, you know, and I would draw all the animals that I'd seen during the day. So my mom's got pictures of like, like eagles and, and um, lions and rhinos and everything that we'd seen during the day. And I'd sit there in the evening and sketch these little animals out. And yeah, it's just something that I've been passionate about. You know, I never thought it's something I would do as a, as a career for me. I was, I was always wanted to be like a game ranger I wanted to live in the bush become a ranger and that was what I wanted to do and the arts was just like a hobby kind of thing you know um but yeah it's just something that's sort of grown with me as I've gotten older and it's become my life now I mean it's literally my entire life it's so crazy were you like a a natural bud like did you just like you could just draw like I don't know is it like did you learn or anything you just sort of like took a no it's just it's just something that I could do like I can look at something and I can paint it and I just know how I can look at colors and I know in my head instinctively how to get those colors and how to mix them and how to create a composition and it's just like a natural thing that comes to me obviously like with any with any talent like you need to practice and you need to do it every single day in order for it to get better so it's just something that was there and it's something that's developed as I've gotten older by practice. I mean, you, you think you're good when you're young, but it's only with practice that you get really, really good. But to my untrained eye, right, I was like looking at some of your pictures, say from, I don't know, 2017 or, or something like that, 16 something, and looking at the ones now and it's like, I mean, it's a world of difference. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know yeah, if, there, if yeah. there was something that all of a sudden just took you to that next level. Yeah, I, I think 
it is a better understanding of colors and how to use colors to create an illusion on, on, a, on a canvas. So for me, when I do a painting, I want something that's almost two dimensional to become three dimensional. In order for to do that, you need to understand colors and how warm colors and cold colors work next to each other and how to just create depth. And that's only come with, with practice. I mean, yeah, it's just something that I've learned and gone to exhibitions, seen other artists, um, actually visiting galleries. I mean, that to me has been the best sort of way that I can understand the technical side of art is by actually going to see these paintings in real life, paintings in the, in the National Gallery in London, for instance, or in Florence, going to see like some of the amazing artwork there. It's only by seeing these things that you sort of get a better understanding of how it all works. And, you're almost and, like you're almost like picking things with your eye. You're picking details with your eye, and you you're storing them in your memory for when you come and for when I come and do my painting. So I've always got these things, little tricks in the back of my head that I think, oh, this will work on that painting, and this will help it become more alive. There's a there's a great book. It's called uh, "Steal Like an Artist." I think it's by a guy called Austin Kleon, yeah. and um, that kind of reminds me of that. You know, like you literally. You know, you're checking out, okay, cool, what's this person doing, how they're doing it, and then you go, okay, cool, well, that could work with me, and then you go and you try it yourself. I think, yeah, wow. Yeah. I mean, but you must have, like, you must have quite the eye and, like, photographic memory to kind of remember these things. Yeah, I think I've got a good, pretty good visual memory. My actual, like, memory of remembering things is rubbish, but visually, I've got quite a good memory. Um, but, yeah, it's just... I'm so passionate about it. So when I see something that I really like, when I see a painting or an artist who I follow on, on social media or something, like when they, when I see some of their art, I look at it and I study it and I try and work out, I try and like dismantle it inside my head and work out how they've done it. So then when it comes to me to do my own paintings, I can almost put into practice what I've dismantled from seeing their art, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, it makes total sense, but um, yeah, I uh, yeah, it's I mean, to me, it's just kind of mind blowing how like, like how you even begin to kind of like dismantle a picture. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, yeah. It's almost like you've got this X ray vision, and you're like, okay, cool, I can see underneath there that you know he must have I don't know drawn this, and then he's used... <laughs> I just don't even know how you would dismantle a drawing. How do you kind of do it? It's all painting. That's exactly it. Yeah, that's exactly it. You can look at a work and you can almost see the layers of where they've started and their whole sort of process, you know, and you, you just take, you just pick and choose little things out of paintings that you like and you combine them into your own artwork and that helps you um, create your style, if you know what I mean. And it's definitely helped my work, elevate my work, is just by actually going to exhibitions and seeing other artists' work. I think that's, that for me has been a major, major, a major factor in helping the work get to where I want it to be. And when you look at other people's work, are you looking at other people that do sort of similar animal type of um, paintings or, or all types? All types of art. I mean, there are a few animal artists that I absolutely love. And there's a few paintings. Um, there's, a, there's a museum uh, in the west of England in a town called Gloucester. It's called Nature and Art. And there's a painting of a lion there. And I saw this painting, gosh, about 10, 12 years ago. And it's just one of those paintings that's just stuck in my head no matter what, because I was so mesmerized by it. I couldn't, for the first time I saw a painting that I just could not work out how he did it. And recently I had, the, I was fortunate enough to go back there a couple of weeks ago and I saw the painting and I actually understood now. I could look at it and I could see, I was like, ah, that's how he did it. And I've sort of taken those elements and I'll put them into my art now, you know? Wow, that's interesting. It, it must have been yeah. quite a like a cool moment for you to go, okay, cool. I've I've actually obviously grown, you know, like a, as an artist and my understanding of art, like since I last saw this painting. Yeah, no, it was. That actually was really satisfying because when I first saw it, I just I was so amazed by it. I mean, it's an incredible artwork. Um, it's one of the best pet lion paintings I've ever seen. It still is now to this day. Um but yeah, just seeing it the first time and not actually being able to work out how he did it and then going back recently and seeing it and actually totally working out, understanding his process, understanding how he the application of, of the paints onto the canvas and his brush strokes 
it's all these little things that I look at and that I try and sort of bring into my own artwork. It's so like technical and complex, isn't it? Like, you know, I mean, <laughs> it's hard to, it's hard for like a, a normie like me to almost imagine the, the effort that goes into doing what you do. That's for sure. Yeah, no, it is, it is quite technical. But again, also on the other hand, it's very, it can be very sort of mind numbing at sometimes, especially when you're doing like painting a leopard, for instance, with all the spots, like it's literally so many different spots. I could spend a week painting a leopard's face, for instance, and it just, it's just, it does become mind numbing. So it helps to listen to podcasts and listen to ridiculously human, obviously. <laughs> that's so cool but i must say i was like blown away but when when we sort of yeah. first like got in contact and you're like oh i'm glad the podcast back and i was like i said to my wife and i was like yes that's so cool like um you know you just never know who's kind of listening to the conversations yeah. and i was like yes yeah, exactly. it's really cool <laughs> no i love it i mean i need to have something to stimulate my mind whilst i'm working because it can get sort of like as I said, monotonous sometimes. And it's nice to have like sort of just that mental stimulation going into your head while you're working. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, and, and it's like, I guess, it, it, can it ever be a distraction though, you know, or is it like, you know, you always kind of put it like, like whatever you're listening to, like low in the background? Yeah, it depends. It depends what I'm doing. Like if I'm, if I'm painting like eyes, for instance, because eyes of the animal, there's so many details and you know, there's so such like minute little changes in color that can affect the whole outlook. And the eyes are the most important. They're the thing that I start with when I do a painting of an animal. I always start with the eyes because that sort of like get that captures the soul of the animal. And once that's in and you've got the eyes correct, the rest of the painting just flows really well. So if I'm doing eyes, for instance, I've, there's a YouTube channel called Africam. And what I do is I put that on because there's no sound. There's no like talking and such but you got the sound of the bush and i really enjoy that like you just literally hear the birds and every now and then you'll hear like elephants or you'll hear some like animals come down to the water hole and like, yeah i just have put my earphones in put that in and it sort of try, takes me to that space oh man it's so cool but um <clears throat> i want to get into all of that stuff um in a moment but i also just want to talk a little bit about uh you and and kind of your your story a bit uh it's funny yesterday i i posted something on instagram and i was like oh i'm speaking to darren tomorrow and then one of my friends this guy nick collins he replied he's like no yeah. ways and i was like what hang on uh do you know darren he's like yeah yeah he's like we went to primary school together and then and, then he, and i was like yeah. have you got any cool memories he's like yeah no um we always used to hang out at the the douglasdale dairy because uh, darren's mom worked there <laughs> and um yeah, yeah and then he said that he he broke his arm at your house uh one day skateboarding and he's never Gosh. been on a skateboard yeah. ever since <laughs> Yeah, I remember that, you know, I actually remember that. <laughs> <laughs> and then he was, the other thing was, he was like, yeah, we always used to go to the drive-in for, for your birthday. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you I remember those things. I definitely do remember. And actually, Nick messaged me the other day, like, I think it was yesterday. And it was such a blast on the past because I do remember him perfectly well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I actually, now that you mentioned him breaking his arm, I remember that as well. Gosh. Yeah, that's the cool thing about this, but it's yeah. like, you know, even just this chat with you and me, you know, like it's it then like it, there's a couple of other sort of people there that, that sort of like, you know, got in contact or I got in contact with as well. Um, Teva Smith, actually, uh, she told me that uh, she bought one of your, I think it was a giraffe um, um, copy. What's a, not, zebra, a, copy? a zebra, a zebra. Yeah, yeah. Zebra, yeah. Um, That's it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. She and she sent me a photo of that. And I was like, wow, that's so cool. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, there was uh, there was Dylan Harold. He was like, "Oh yeah, Darren. He had a great middle parting at school, and and he was always a bit I of a excellent middle parting. <laughs> you did, eh? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. then um, he was like, "Yo, he was always a bit of a rebel, and he used to wear those buckle shoes." And I was like, "Oh yeah, he used to wear those buckle yeah. shoes. I remember. How did he get yeah. away with that, the bastard?" <laughs> yeah, I don't know how I did. I mean, I think in school, like I, I always. I, I've always had an issue with people like telling me what to do, like how to do things. And when people do that, I generally go against it for some reason. I don't know why. It's just my personality, I suppose. But yeah, I think the buckle shoes and then like trying to get away with the longest hair possible in school 
was all part of that bit of a rebellious streak saying, you can't tell me what to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, I love school, don't get me wrong. I love the time there, the people, they were amazing. Um, but yeah, I definitely had that. And I think that rebellious streak is something that I've carried with me. I mean, I'm much more risk averse nowadays than as I'm older. Um, but yeah, it's just something that's always been a part of my personality. Yeah. I think it's a nice trait to have, to be honest with you, bud, because I don't know, too many people maybe just um, are maybe too fearful of sort of uh, rebelling or or doing something different. And and the world needs the world needs rebels, you know, because that's what really yeah. creates change, you know? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I I think growing up, like everyone used to say to me, oh, um, what sort of job are you going to do when you're older? And, you know, like they're always saying like, what... You know, I always had this, like, in school, they always used to say, oh, what sort of career are you going to go into? And, like, I never thought that I wanted to do, like, a proper job, you know what I mean? For me, it was always, like, as I said, a game ranger. Um, and then the art sort of just came into it. And that's, I suppose, you can sort of combine the two, like a rebellious nature and being an artist. They sort of work well together. Um, you're sort of going against what society tells you what to do and what's the correct pathway to go down, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's my kind of like um, thoughts on artists, you know, like, uh, I think artists have like a huge role in society. And um, they, they kind of define society quite a bit as well, um, in terms of, you know, like, you can express yourself. Um, you can express yourself so differently, you know, and, and, and it's up to everyone to interpret how what you're expressing sort of thing, you know, and you can be way yeah. out there. And um uh, someone will pick someone will look at what you're doing and, and just sort of have like a completely different perspective to somebody else but i think art plays a plays a huge role in society and of therefore no, artists definitely yeah definitely i mean some of the most amazing people that i've met in my life have been artists um i mean we'll get into it a bit later but like when i had my studio in london um yeah they're just people that i'm still friends with nowadays and they just they had such a big impact on my life and they're just really really cool people I'm completely yeah. mad as I had some of them, but really, really cool. Yeah, yeah. I think those two go hand in hand as well, but <laughs> they they yeah, yeah, um, a little bit left field, but but that's also that's what kind of like that's what it takes, you know. You can't just be a, a normal thinker to to sort of change the world and to be an artist and to be expressive, like you you, you almost have to have a screw loose, like not in a in a vet in in like a horrible way, but do you know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. There, there's um there's something special yeah, about definitely. you, should I say? <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I agree. Like you've got to have that sort of desire to do something that not everyone is going to believe in, you know, and you've got to be able to pursue that no matter what anyone says to become an artist. You've got to really just believe in what you're doing in order for other people to believe it as well. Darren, do you think that like the system sort of destroys our creativity as a uh, like as a child or as a person? Yeah, I, th I think it does. I think growing up, you're sort of like taught that you've got to have a proper career, that you've got to go and do an office job or do a trade or something, you know, like, and pe there's no sort of like, people can't sort of take it seriously that you can actually make a living from it, from, from being an artist. And I th think nowadays, like the opportunities out there with social media for so many people, many more people to do that. I mean, you don't have to be in a gallery in order to sell art. You can have an Instagram page, you can have a Facebook page, you can have a TikTok page and all those things open yourself up to the entire world. So you don't necessarily have to go down that route of having a proper trade or career. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's still, it's not like an easy pathway to choose, to go down. There's ups and there's downs and there's a lot of challenges involved, but I think it's like that with every, every single career. Um, but yeah, if you're passionate about something, then you've got to pursue it. You've got to like put all your heart, all your energy into it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I always remember like back at school, you know, the guys that did art, you know, the art class, like, oh yeah, there's, there's guys, there's guys that do art, you know, <laughs> you kind of like, we yeah. were, it was almost drummed into our head as like even pupils that's you know the art guys yeah well they're taking arts like an easy subject you know like it's yeah, just like yeah, it's so ridiculous and 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 yeah i like now like i look back and i think obviously you're much more worldly when you when you're older and i'm like yes yeah, see i wish 
I wish I had taken art or something, you know, because actually I, I do kind of like to draw and um, yeah, it's, it's kind of sucks a little bit how you kind of made to think that, you know, the thing to do is to study, to be an accountant or a flip and whatever. And it's like, yeah, oh, well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I had the same sort of feeling like when, when I was in school, like I always thought like I was never academic, academically great, you know, like I was sort of average, but I was good at art and I always thought, oh, um, I always had a bit of envy of the people that were much cleverer than I, I was because I just thought, well, these guys are going to do really well, you know, and they're going down the right pathway. And like, I'm, I'm a bit lost and what have you. But yeah, I think if you found something that you're good at, you've just got to pursue it. And I think that's something that's just stuck with me. Yeah, I mean, your story, but it's, it's you know, we'll get into it just now, but like hard work is definitely something that uh, comes naturally to you, you know, by the sounds of it. And and that's what yeah. it takes, you know, when you've got a, when you've got a talent, you actually have to sort of pursue that talent. Um, you can't just sort of sit on your kind of like, you know, high horse and go, yeah, no, well, I'm really good. So I can draw once a, once a week and, you know, I'll, I'll be great. Like, no, no, that's yeah. not how it works. You know, you have to really <laughs> apply your trade. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You You've got to treat it like a job. You've got to get up in the morning and you've got to literally treat it like a job. And I mean, you've got to probably work harder than you would in an office job, for instance, because you're working for yourself. Um, you know, I literally paint with every hour that I can get. Yeah. I had a, I had a guy on the podcast a, a while ago and he was like an entrepreneur and he's like, and he used to be like in the corporate world. And he's like, uh, and as an entrepreneur, you eat what you kill right? Like, and I was like, oh, yeah. that's quite a nice analogy, you know, like for anybody that kind of works for themselves, like you've got to flip and go and you've got to show up every single day, you know, and it's the same, like, it doesn't matter what you do uh, as an entrepreneur, but you've got to show up every single day and, and that's, will put food on the table ultimately. Yeah. I mean, I get asked that so many times by people, they always say, oh, what do you do when you don't feel like working and you don't feel like painting? And to be honest, I don't have the option. Like, you know, you've got to just do it you know what I mean like if I don't feel like painting the best solution is to go there pick up my brushes and just start and immediately like it's going to take a bit longer than a normal day but you will get into it you know you will find that rhythm and yeah it's exactly that you just there's no there's no space for giving up you've just got to do it it's almost like this, the same thing as like if you you know exercising and stuff you like you wake up in the morning and you're like oh I really don't feel like going for a run or whatever it is but you go, you know, and then like five minutes in, you're like, yeah, see, I'm so flipping happy. I went for this run because I feel awesome. And it's probably almost the same yeah. thing, you know, with the art. It's exactly the same thing. That's such a good analogy. It is exactly the same thing. Yeah. yeah. It's just finding that motivation and just putting aside any sort of like laziness and negative feelings about it and just doing it. I think it's like, it's almost finding the discipline. Do you know what I mean? To just go, okay, cool. I know I've got to do that. You know, the that that's kind of what's what gets you on those days where you don't have the motivation yeah and it's also i also think it's um you got to think about the end result i think that is what motivates me a lot with the painting um especially on those days where i don't feel like working i look at the painting and i think um yeah i mean this painting is going to be lovely when it's done and that sort of just sort of motivates me to get it done because i'm excited to see the end i want to see what it looks like I was wondering now, I was like, have you ever looked at a painting and like, I don't know, been in like a bad mood and gone, oh, and just like <laughs> snap the thing in half or anything? <laughs> no, there's, there's been times where I've just the paintings have just beaten me and you just can't, no matter what you do, it just doesn't seem to come right. So with those, I generally just take them off the wooden stretcher bars, roll them up and put them away. Um, and then I always think to myself, you know, I'll go back to it one day, but 99% of the time I don't, I just write them off really. And you've got to allow yourself, you've got, you've got to allow yourself that you can't beat yourself up about making mistakes and not getting it right. It's all part of the learning process. You know, if you don't make those mistakes, if you don't have those accidents or those moments, then you'll never learn. You'll never get any better. hundred percent. But that's the only way we learn eh, is through our mistakes. And, um, yeah, yeah so yeah, so, so bad. Um, 
you said that the first sort of commission that you had paint, paid painting was actually um, for our, I think it was Mr. Boerter was like deputy head or, or something, wasn't yeah. he, of, of our, of our yeah. school. And he actually bought yeah. your first, first painting. <laughs> Tell yeah, me about that. First but... painting. Yeah, it was weird because I did a painting for art. I can't remember what, the, what we had to do. And Mr. Puerta saw this and he was like, oh, can you do something similar for my bar? And I was like, yeah, why not? And he said, I'll paint you for it. And I was like, okay, definitely. <laughs> so I did in this painting and um, yeah, I think it was a lion with the kudu and like a sunset. It was, I mean, it was pretty cool back in the day. Um, but yeah, it was like such a big thing for me because it was the first time that someone was willing to pay me for a, for a painting. And it wasn't like, a little bit of money it was quite a big chunk of money for a school kid you know um so i was really really excited about that i did the painting and um yeah i mean i got a message from this i think andre's wife i can't remember her name sorry um i got a message from her probably about six months ago um on facebook just uh, like really like saying oh we've been following you and just to let you know that we've still got the painting hanging up in our wall and they sent me a photo and they've still got the painting hanging up in their bar, which to me, that was so amazing because it's like, I mean, that's such a long time ago, you know, like 25 years and they still have the same painting hanging up, which is really cool. That's super cool. But yeah, that sort, of, that sort of gave me the belief in myself, in the art, if you know what I mean. It sort of like planted a seed that I thought, actually, maybe this is something that I could do, that I could become an artist, you know? Um, so that seed was planted from that and I really, I really credit Mr. Boerter himself for planting that seed because without that commission, I don't think I would have ever had the belief in myself, you know? Wow, that's amazing. But I think um, it's so amazing how somebody can like have such a huge influence on a life or something, like some decision, you know, it, it like like that kind of like had like almost sort of changed the trajectory maybe of your life. You know, someone was like, Hey, yeah, yes, you just, can you just paint me something and I'll pay you a bit of cash for it. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. It definitely changed the trajectory. Like I said, it gave me the belief in being able to do this as a living. Um, yeah, but I never knew it would be this difficult, like to get to this point where I am now. It's been a real challenge. <laughs> one of One of the things that you, love painting our leopards and yeah. you have like i don't know i'd love to know the story about like how that came about when you went to to work on like a, a golf estate on the, on the south uh of the kruger national park that sounds incredible yeah yeah so what happened was my dad he's he used to have a swimming pool company in johannesburg and um one of his clients was the group marketing director for for the intercontinental hotels and they had a hotel at Leopard Creek. Um, the thing was called Mullan Sun. It was part of the Leopard Creek Golf Estate. And he basically said to me, why don't you go and be like our resident artist? Um, and you can literally just sit there on the sort of lookout point, have a display of art and paint. And it sort of came in a time in my life where I was a bit directionless. You know, I was a bit of a, I didn't know what I wanted to do. You know, I was getting, I was sort of going down the wrong road. I was getting involved with the wrong kind of people you know just becoming a bit more rebellious and for me I looked at it as a way just to like get away from things for a bit and um yeah so I said yeah that'd be awesome I'd love to do that so I went there um and I became there as an artist and literally I spent my days painting overlooking the crocodile river on this like lookout point and because it was quite sort of an international hotel so you had a lot of people uh international tourists that would come through and stay at the hotel and they would buy the art off me and that just sort of like completely transformed my life it really like gave me such a solid foundation um just to sort of like work forwards if you know what I mean it really made me believe that I could actually turn this into a career because I was I was able to sell art at this place to people you know it was just something yeah it was life-changing that's amazing, man. And it also looked like quite a special, almost spiritual place to base yourself. Yeah, no, it was like literally because I was on my own. I, was, I mean, I had the guests obviously coming down to the lookout point. But being on my own, literally just painting there, you became so sort of in tune with the bush. Like I sort of understood like when there was 
a leopard, for instance, nearby, like you'd hear the monkeys and then you'd hear the, the alarm call. And I'd be like, oh, there's something there, you know, and I'd like sit there and wait and wait and wait. And all of a sudden you'd see like a leopard or a snake or something. And it just became like a place I would, I would work during the day and then I'd hike up this little mountain and I'd go watch the sunset. And it, it just became something of like a meditative sort of experience for me, you know, like it was difficult in the beginning. I'm not going to lie because I was literally on my own a lot of the time. And because I was so used to being surrounded by people, I just didn't know how to deal with your thoughts in your head. You know, you become really like sort of like your own worst enemy in many, in many regard. Um, but I think after time, after just sort of like accepting things and, and sort of realizing that painting is what I need to do and just meditating, looking at the sunset every day is something that I'll always remember it's something that I've just carried with me, like to this age, to the age that I am now, I still think about it. I still think about those times when I would go and watch the sunset, you know, and listen to the bush, just something I've always had with me. I think if you've never been to the African bush, it's, it's almost like difficult to explain that experience to somebody. You know, there's, there's something about the bush, but that is like, I don't know. It almost feels like it's part of us, you know? And it's like, yeah. I don't know. There's some, I don't, I don't even know how to explain it. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you can feel exactly. the bush. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's like a primitive feeling, you know, for me. It's, um, I think it's, it's just sort of, it harks back to probably that time when we were cavemen, you know, running around, you know, it's just, there's something primitive in your spirit that awakens when you're in the bush for me, especially, um, yeah, it's just the atmosphere and the sounds and the smells and the, the heat and all those different elements that come together. That sort of like, yeah, it just awakens my senses. So did you come in close contact with many leopards and stuff while you there? Is that what kind of like serves as your inspiration for painting those animals? Yeah, I mean, I've always been fascinated by leopards. Um, it's just one of those animals that... I, I would, you know, people say, what's your spiritual animal? I would say mine's in there, but I think it's because it's a solitary hunt, you know, it spends a lot of time on its own. I spend a lot of time on my own and it's just something that I've connected with. I love the eyes of a leopard, especially, you know, there's just something that about them that when they look at you, it, it almost feels as if they're looking right through you into your soul. And it's just, it's something that I'll never, ever get tired of. I'm so passionate about them, especially, um, yeah, it's just, I've had so many sightings of them as well, you know, I've been like painting down by the river when I was there, there at the Crocodile River, and um, I would have like leopards literally come down on the opposite end of the bank, and there was no one else there, it was literally just me, and you could see them across the river, um, I've been on game drives where the leopards literally been like probably about an arm's way width away from me, looking straight at me, and it's little things like that have just inspired me over the years, and it's just something, it's one of the animals that I completely will never, ever get tired of painting. They're bloody hard to paint, don't get me wrong, but I'll always, always love doing them. But I think they, they're they not looking through you, but they, they actually want to eat you. So um, that's what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think so too. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, funny stuff, but, it, but there is something so incredible when you see an animal like that in the wild and so close. Uh, we had an experience um, where we where we were like super close to this like female lion, this lioness uh, in, um, uh, in in a park near the Kruger. But I think um, I must have aged a few years um, <laughs> in that moment yeah. when yeah. when it got up and it roared and it walked past us, and um, you just realize, okay, cool, I'm actually like this real little sort of um, part of nature that is really kind of um kind of weak i guess uh, compared to to the wild animals because she would have she would have eaten me for breakfast and everyone else in the car no problem if she wanted to <laughs> yeah exactly it, it does make you feel really insignificant but for me also like one of the things that i'm amazed by especially when you see these animals in the wild is how big they are like you never really grasp how the size of these things until you actually see them in the wild you know and they have like a presence like you know, if leopards, for instance, or any predator, like when you're in the bush um, and you you may not even know that, that, that the leopard or the lion is there, but you can feel it, you know, there's an atmosphere 
that changes, you know, and they, they just have this like presence. But they are massive. Like this lioness, I swear yeah. her, her back was like almost as tall as I am. You know what I mean? Like that was the highest yeah. when she's, but, but the, the roar, but honestly, it went through your body. You could feel like this, like thudder, like, like this, like, you know, vibration yeah. in your kind of like yeah. chest. When that's was like, such Whoa. a cool feeling. I love that. Don't you? That's amazing. Don't you think? Oh, but I'll never, ever forget that, you know, and I've, and, you know, I'll tell this story yeah. the rest of my life sort of thing. And, and you're right, but there's, there's something so special about it. That's for sure. Um, so, but I, you, you mentioned that you met, met a lot of um, like, I guess, international guests and stuff uh, where you work there. Yeah. Uh, was that one of the sort of precursors for you to decide to move to the UK? Um, one of the reasons for moving to the UK was, yeah, I wanted to be in a more international market for the art. I mean, at this time in South Africa, early 2000s, um, it did feel a bit cut off from the rest of the world. You know, it was still, there wasn't like the internet that we have today and the sort of like how connected everything is nowadays. Back then it wasn't. So I just thought, well, I need to go and like try and get into like experience a wider market, a more international market and just see what happens. So um, I was fortunate enough that my, my parents are British so I could just sort of hop over to the UK. And initially I was only going to be here for like a couple of years. And yeah, I just sort of got sucked into life in the UK and I haven't left to be honest. Um, but yeah, it, that was one of the catalysts was definitely trying to get into a more international market. It's funny because you mentioned that your your dad was was born in Essex. And um I mean yeah. we, we know what like the Essex wide boys are like. And I was joking with you before we yeah. before we while we were on WhatsApp, you know, in the last few weeks, I was like, ah, oh, I can see that part of you in you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it makes sense now, doesn't it? <laughs> it does make sense, but yeah. it makes sense. Um yeah. it's funny because I go down to we get our dog groomed down in Essex every couple of every sort of four weeks or so. And I go down there and I'm literally like go to the area where my dad was born. And it's it's a weird feeling. I think, oh, this is where like I'm from, really, if you think about it. Um, but yeah. yeah, it's definitely a sort of Essexness, I suppose you could say. <laughs> <laughs> Classic, but but one of the interesting things for me, and we spoke about this at the start, was like, you know, when you get to the UK, um, you almost in, uh, definitely going to be doing odd jobs, you know, and yeah. um, it sounded like that was what you were doing. But then you would go from your job, whatever it was at the time, to uh, your bedroom. I'm I'm just making assumptions there. You can tell me, but like, you know, I'm yeah. assuming you like rented a house and shared a room somewhere and then yeah, you just painted house. all night. So yeah, yeah. what was that I like? Mean, yeah, that was difficult, you know, like, because I came to the UK with all these like high and mighty ambitions, you know, I was thinking, oh, I'm the best painter here and like, it's going to be really easy, you know, and you get here and you have like a massive dose of reality because you all of a sudden, um, you're a, a, like a tiny little fish in this huge pond, you know? So I realized that it wasn't going to be an easy journey and I had to sort of, I couldn't just come in and paint and do nothing, you know, I had to actually work. So I got all these random jobs, you know, I was working on building sites. I was doing everything, but in, I would always make sure that in the evenings when I finished work, I would go and paint. I always had something to work on. And like, I would get home in the evenings and I would obviously have dinner and what have you. And I'd set up a little corner in the room with my easel and I would paint and I would just, I didn't know what I was going to do with the painting. I didn't know where it was going to go. I had no galleries. I didn't have any idea what would happen with this painting, but I knew in my heart that it's something that I had to do um, no matter what. And it also, it just helped me to sort of like, um, focus on my on my ambition you know what I mean like even if I couldn't see the pathway of how I was going to get to where I wanted to get to I knew that if I did what I needed to do which was painting something would happen like the doors would open up so yeah I just made sure that I always worked and you know I entered it many competitions and you know you got I got rejected from a few places um and that was difficult it was really really difficult because you like you really thought like you were the best of, of the best, you know, and all of a sudden you're rejecting, you think, oh, I, must, I can't be that good. You know what I mean? Mm. But I think I've learned over the years that it's not really like rejection of you as a person. It's just maybe your art doesn't fit into that 
gallery or that exhibition as such. It's got nothing to do with your art as such, if you know. Um, but yeah, it just it's helped me become a better artist, definitely. How did you deal with that rejection in the moment? You know, it's like, I guess it's easy kind of like looking back, you know, but in the moment you can imagine it was a different feeling. Yeah, no, it was. It's a real dent to your ego, you know, because a rejection is not an easy thing. Um, and people t tend to take it quite personally, which I did in the beginning, you know, I used to take it really personally, but then I, I sort of learned over time that it's not something that you can take personally, you know, like those moments of rejection, I would be rejected and I'd think, you know what, screw you guys, I'm still going to paint. And I did that, you know, I got straight back into it. And I just thought if, if this paint is no good, I'm making sure the next one's even better, you know? So it's just that idea of like becoming better and better. Wow. That says a lot about you as a person, you know, just to kind of like go, oh, you know what, screw you guys. And I, I know that um, I am good and that uh, I will make this. Uh, so I'm just going to carry on going. Yeah, it's stubbornness as well. You know, I was, I'm still stubborn now. Um, but that's helped in the sort of whole process of getting me to where I am. Um, but yeah, uh, you've just got to like, just put aside any feelings of attack on you as a person, which it never is. And you've just got to carry on doing it. You know, you've got to get back on that horse, as I'd say. Have you ever like thought of packing it all in? Um. I don't think so, no. Like for me, I can't imagine life now without doing it. Like it's it's almost a part of who I am. You know, like I need to paint every day. It's like breathing. It's something that I have to do. I mean, there was a moment, there's been a few moments like where I thought, ah, oh, it'd be really cool just to have like a normal job and not have to like work all these hours and, you know, come home in the evening and not have to worry about like getting this painting done for that deadline and that deadline. But then it, I look at myself and I'm really fortunate to be able to do what I'm doing. So I just didn't knock those feelings aside. Yeah, bad for sure. Uh, was it was it like a pivotal moment in the UK when things changed? Um, yeah, you know, after painting in my room for a long time, um, I managed to get an art studio. And to me, that was like, that was a massive, massive step um, because all of a sudden I was painting, not surrounded by any artists, not knowing any other artists in London at all. All of a sudden you're in this like massive group of artists and you get all their feedback and you get their criticism, constructive criticism. And they sort of like, it definitely helped me to sort of develop my style, if you know what I mean. Um, but yeah, having that studio was a, a massive, massive thing because what they would do is they'd have people, you'd have open studios. So you'd have, it was open to the public twice a year. And it basically was like a massive exhibition, really. And any old person could come through and you could sell your art. And the very first open studio I did, I sold all my paintings, which was at the first time that's ever happened to me. You know, like it wasn't even like, it was the first sort of exhibition as such I had in London. And I sold everything, which was just absolutely amazing. And you know, those people that bought those paintings, they still collect my art now. And this is, I don't know, 20 years ago. Um, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. So like literally, um, how long did it take to sort of sell everything out? Um, uh, well, probably about two days. Because you had <laughs> like an open. <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it was really cool. Like, and you know, like it was such a boost, like a sort of boost to my my, my um, ambition, if you know what I mean. I think that's right. We're saying it was it was just such a boost of confidence, you know, like it gave me the belief that I needed, that I needed to pursue this and I could turn it into an actual job. And bearing in mind that it, well, I was still doing my odd jobs every day, like I would still go to the studio after work every single day, every single weekend. I was literally there. It was like a second home for me. Wow. That's incredible. Did you, yeah. did you have like a little bed set up there if you need to have a nap or anything? No. I wish I probably should have really. I mean, I was there until like 12, one o'clock in the mornings. In fact, there were other artists there at the same time. And, you know, you had this community of people and I made such good friends there. It was just, so, it was a really, really good um, sort of time in my life, really. Um, and also, you know, like with, with the studio being open to the public, you had galleries that came through as well. And that sort of like definitely opened up some massive doors as well. Like all of a sudden your work is, 
there for gallery owners to come and see and they sort of took an interest and yeah it sort of like opened up many doors how do you deal with uh with feedback on your uh on your paintings like i don't know if you ever like say you when you're in the galleries you like um you know you're busy painting and then another artist comes and they go oh well you know have you thought about this like does that ever happen or, or how do you deal with that if it does yeah you know it definitely does happen like i actually really like constructive feedback you know like because you looking at a painting or you're doing something every day it's nice to have someone else with fresh eyes that comes through and can see things that you miss and also the artists they i mean they definitely help me develop my style they help me like isolate certain things that needed working on and it was all constructive you know um and you know sometimes during exhibitions you're going to get negative feedback from people but you know i've learned over the years that art is subjective not everyone's gonna like the same art it's like music not everyone has the same taste in music so if someone doesn't like your art it's fine if they don't like it it's all good to me it doesn't bother me at all um yeah because for i know sure. for every person that doesn't like there's gonna be someone else that does you know but uh, it's I, I would find it very hard to uh criticize uh your art that's for sure so um but like you said it's just just people's taste at the end of the day um, yeah yeah that's what it is yeah for sure because it is really really amazing i mean i even remember like it was probably like i don't know maybe four or five years ago um i sort of came across your instagram page and 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 i was like yeah I see like that's that's amazing you know what i mean and um and then Thanks. yeah and then it was just really cool to sort of re sort of um connect again and and, and think because uh, i was speak i think i was speaking to marissa about you and i was like yeah i know this guy from school like he, he's a really good painter and then we were like went and we searched your instagram again this was like few, you know about a month or two ago and that's when we got in touch again yeah. and i was like yes it was really yeah. really sensational stuff but um it's a pity I didn't even realize you were living in the UK because, yeah, I mean, obviously I was there for a long time as well and it would have been, would have been rad to catch up, that's for sure. But uh, Yeah, no, definitely would. But that'll, that'll happen now, but um, when we get back to Portugal. So um, you I'll but, have to come over there to Portugal. <laughs> yeah, but for sure. So, so you also yeah. lived in Switzerland, didn't you? Like, wh why did yeah. you kind of like pick up sticks? And, and it wasn't just a short like stint. You were there for three years. Three years I was there. Um. The person, the partner that I was with at the time got a job out there. So we moved out there and honestly, it was, it was like starting from scratch, but with a language barrier in between. Um, but yeah, I mean, I still continue to paint. I had a little sort of like a room that I turned into a little studio and I painted. And um, I had like a few little exhibitions there in the area that we're staying in and had like a yearly fair kind of thing. And I decided to have a stand at this fair and my goodness, that was difficult because it was, everyone was speaking Swiss German and I can't speak a word of Swiss German. Um, I was so lucky though, that at a previous exhibition that I had in Switzerland, I made friends with a, a, a chap called Julian, who's still one of my best friends today, to be honest, he bought a paint, picture from me and became one of my best mates. And he basically came to this exhibition with me every single day and he translated nonstop. <laughs> It was amazing, but it was really, really difficult. Um, it was a lovely time living there. Um, yeah, I don't have any regrets about being there. It was a lovely place to live, definitely. Yeah, what you do for love, hey, bud? You like uh, change yeah, your exactly. whole, whole, whole life where things are going super well and pick up sticks and start, yeah. start fresh. And <laughs> that's yeah. just uh, that's also part of the lessons and journey of life, isn't it? Yeah, no, it definitely is. So, um. I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about like your kind of process um, in terms okay. of like, like what you do, because I, because I mean, I just think it's fascinating. And I mean, you, you're such an expert at like what to do. Um, can you sort of maybe just sort of put it like, just speak about the sort of steps that you do to, to take a, you know, to start your paintings or, you know, what, what, what yeah. do you do? Yeah, so basically the most important thing is getting the right image because, you, I mean, I'd love to paint them directly from my head, but you can't. You need to have some sort of reference material. So there's quite a few photographers. I, I, use, I can use my own photos when I've got some really cool images, but there's quite a few photographers online that are happy for you to use their work. I mean, you've got to pay some of them. Um, so what I'll do is if I'll see something that sort of like speaks to me, like an element of a photo or something, I think that's actually going to work really well as a painting. 
and I get a really excited feeling inside about the image and I think oh, I really want to paint that I want to sort of enhance this area change this area and just turn it into an artwork so that's the most important thing is finding the correct image um, so I'll get in contact with the photographers they'll give me the images and then I'll just sort of like design a composition online um, through Procreate or, or Adobe Photoshop and I'll just sort of get like a basic understanding of how, how the artwork will look before I attempt to do it and then it's yeah you just draw out the subject get all your proportions correct and I start with the eyes so I'll literally spend maybe like two or three days if I'm doing a leopard or a lion and I'll make sure the eyes are as accurate as possible so you'll have usually what will happen is you'll have this massive uh, white canvas with these two eyes looking at you and then I just sort of develop the painting from that so you just I work in layers so the first layer of paint is always very sort of like soft and um, watered down um, because I work in oil paint there's a rule so you can't paint thick oil paint over thick oil paint you've got to sort of like build your layers up so you start very thin and then you gradually build up the layers as the painting develops so yeah, that's sort of my process. It's a very sort of like shortened down description of it, but that's the way I work really. And and like how long do you sort of sit down, you know, at each kind of sitting? Um, a painting generally takes about two to three weeks in generally. So I'll sit usually from about, I don't know, half nine in the morning until about, up to seven, eight. I mean, I used to be able to work for a lot longer in the evenings, but I get to a point at the end of the day where I literally can't concentrate anymore. Like I just, I'm losing concentration when I'm putting down the brush strokes, and that's when I know I need to stop. You know, my mind sort of wanders, and then you just sort of, you need to concentrate when you're doing it. And when I can't concentrate, that's when I stop. So yeah, it's, a, it's like a job. You know, I treat it like a job. I've got to put in all those hours from the morning until the evening. And, and like, are you, like, are you sitting down? Are you standing? Like, is it a mix? Like, yeah, it's a mix. I, I, to be honest, I sit down a lot more than I stand. Um, just purely because I'm actually quite close to the canvas a lot of the time, you know. Um, when I'm doing really large paintings, I tend to stand a bit more. Um, but I like to, um, you know, I'm sitting down and then I'll stop and I'll get up and I'll walk away. I need to look at the painting from a distance every sort of couple of hours or whatever so i'll stand up and i'll just go and look at it and just study it and see what areas need changing what things are working what things are and and what the next sort of process or the next step should be in the artwork because it's like i look at it like as a jigsaw puzzle you know like doing a painting is like literally putting in all the pieces in the right position so you know like when you do a puzzle you start with the outside and you just sort of work your way in and it's the same with a painting, you know, you've got your subject and you just sort of have all your big blocked in colors is sort of like, um, how would I describe it? It's, it, it is like you subtracting the subject down to its barest form, if you know what I mean. So you're looking at colors, really, you're, not, you're just looking at colors, shapes, lines, and then you just sort of build the, sub, the, the painting up from that. But it's amazing. And, and the, you mentioned the concentration. Um, there's actually like a really interesting sort of statistic around the energy use of the body. Like it's something like our brain uses about something. I mean, it's, it's high. It's like 65 to 75% of the energy that we need every single day, you know, like, um, so you must, you must kind of like go to bed exhausted and sleep like a log. Yeah, I do. To be honest, like I'll often feel absolutely exhausted by the end of some days. Um, you know, and I think to myself, like I actually haven't done anything physical, but I feel physically drained at some points. Um, but yeah, it must be that it is. It's just the energy that it takes to do some of these paintings, especially when it's like a real complicated painting, like an elephant or you know, a leopard or something like that. It just takes up so much energy. Whenever you have to focus, like that's when you kind of like really up the kind of energy use of your brain. It's like when you go for a, a you know, like you go on a long drive, like you've got to drive, I don't know, say from Joburg to Durban, whatever. And you find that you get there and because you've been focused, you know, you've got to avoid the sort of crazy drivers and, and, and whatnot and stay focused, whatever. Like you get there and you're like, yes, yeah, I'm quite tired. 
but it's because of your brain energy. Yeah. So um, it makes a, it makes a ton of sense. But um, and how do you like? How do you deal with like say distractions? Do you ever get distracted when you when you're painting? Yeah, massively. I've got two dogs, and they are the biggest distractions in the world. But they're good distractions. So um, I tend to um, what I'll do is I'll walk the dogs in the morning um, before I start work, and that sort of like definitely helps focus my mind um and then yeah when they come in to bug me i just sort of like give them a little cuddle um but i'm able to go back to where i was you know what i mean but sometimes if we're like when i'm really like in the flow like when you're doing a painting uh you get into what you call like a i call it a flow state you know like you, everything like you're not thinking about where you're putting the paint you're not thinking about the position of your brush and what have you it just sort of happens naturally and that is the that is the point where you really like make the most progress in an artwork. And for me, when I start in the morning, I always try and get into that state. And that takes at least two or three hours. So when I'm in that position, like I don't even want to answer text messages on my phone. I don't want any distractions at all because the minute you stop, it, you'll never. It's so difficult to get back into that flow state of mind. It's a really so, nice... yeah. Any distraction, I just try. To... It's a really nice place to get into is that flow state you know you almost you almost kind of forget where you are you're kind of like just so focused and you're just like really in your element onto you and you and you're like whoa yeah there was three hours gone <laughs> yeah and and that's the part that i love most about painting is getting to that position it, it's actually you know it's a real physical feeling you know it's not even it's like an actual physical feeling and emotion that you have um and when I paint in the, when I start in the morning, um, I always have that in the back of my head. I always think, oh, I really want to get to that point. And there's some days where I don't, you know, it's a real sort of like stop, start challenge. Um, but yeah, ultimately every single day, my goal is to get into that flow state, at least for a few hours, um, just to have that feeling. Uh, just that feeling definitely transcends into the artwork, I think. For sure, but... Um... Do you, uh, what, what, tell me about uh, Cooper and Clementine. So do they, they like, they sit there with you like ever, um, like completely quiet or they, <laughs> are they dogs like that? Yeah, no, they're actually really good. Cooper's, he's a little angel. Like he, he's got no problem. He's, I mean, he's older than Clementine and um, Clementine's still a bit of a puppy. So she is, because she's grown up with me painting and she's always been around it. Like she just knows that when I'm working, she doesn't come and like try and like bug me. Like she'll come up and like stick her head on my lap and she wants a little cuddle or something. I'm able just to like give her a head a scratch or something. But yeah, they're, they're good distractions. I love them to bits, to be honest. Do you wear like um, comfy clothes to paint in? Or, or do you like, okay, cool, this is my job. I'm going to put on a, a lacquer like shirt uh, and paint. I go, <laughs> what do you do with it when it comes to clothes? <laughs> No, I wear the same clothes every day, to be honest, when I'm painting, because a lot of them are paint on them. I don't want to wreck them anymore. And they are really comfy. Like, I try and wear, like, clothes that I'm not going to be, like, uncomfortable in. I need to be able to have movement. I need to have that warmth. I just need to be comfortable when I'm working. Um, I don't like dressing up at all. So, to be honest, I'd be happy just to wear flip-flops and shorts and a T-shirt every day <laughs> and work like that. But obviously, living in the UK, that's not possible. Yeah, but that's definitely not possible. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, at least they have they make good tracksuits in the UK, you know. So, so you're lucky, yeah, lucky when it comes to that. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. You, how do you deal with like the isolation of what you do? Because humans are very energetic beings, right? And we kind of almost rely on each other for to kind of like sometimes get us through the day, or or just to have like a bit of an outlet. I'm assuming you kind of like are mostly there by yourself. It must be quite difficult sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, no, it is. It's a very sort of like lonely job. I mean, I've, there's been some days where I literally will get up in the morning and I don't speak to a single soul except my wife in the evening when she comes back from work or whatever. Um, I've just, over the years, I've gotten used to it. You know, when I was at the studio, it was good because you had all the other artists there. So you had that human interaction. Um, but now I'm just sort of used to it. You know, I, I listen to podcasts. I listen to talk radio. I just try and have something 
that's mentally stimulating at the same time, you know, um, in the background or whatever, just something talking. Um, I don't often listen to music anymore when I'm working. I prefer just to hear something. I'll, I mean, sometimes I'll have like a war documentary on, you know, something random, you know, just to sort of like take away that feeling of isolation. Yeah, but I can I can imagine it. It is difficult. Um, so uh, yeah, because I I remember like when I left uh, investment banking years ago, uh, like a few months afterwards, I was like, yes, yeah, see, I actually really miss the people. You know, like I really don't miss yeah. the work and everything too much, but I really miss the people. So um, yeah. it takes a, it takes a special type of person to kind of uh, almost doing what you're doing and like just be very comfortable with your own uh, with your own company in your own skin. And uh, to make sure that you do have, like you said, like that little yeah. bit of intellectual stimulation still coming in from podcasts or, or whatever it is. Um, you also mentioned to me yeah. that you, you generally have like two pictures going on or two paintings going on at the same time. Um, why do you do that? It's just really to keep me, keep me motivated. Um, if you if you work on one painting like the whole time, you're not gonna you're gonna make mistakes and you're not gonna be able to see those mistakes because you become so like drawn into the artwork, if you know what I mean. Whereas with two paintings, what I've found over the years is I can work a bit on one and if I get a bit bored on it, I can go to the next one, do a bit on that and go back to the other one and just see, oh, actually if I change that, that's gonna look a bit better. So it just helps keep things fresh, you know. You don't wanna you don't want the work to become stale, you don't wanna become be motivated by it because you'll never finish it. So it just helps things to, yeah, just stay fresh. How many like unfinished paintings do you have there in your in your studio now? Do you have like rolls and rolls and rolls of canvases that uh, <laughs> that, you, that you're probably never going to look at again? Yeah, I've got about four rolls of paintings that won't see the light of day. No one sees them but me. And I've got in the mo at the moment I've got three paintings that are on the go in the studio. Of various different sizes. So I've got a huge lion, I've got a and two tigers. And these are for F for the gallery that I'm working at. Um I was I was wondering like how do you stay like inspired to kind of like do this day in and day out? Yeah. Yeah. Inspiration is a tricky thing, I think. It's not something that is just gonna fall in your lap, you know. And people often always say, oh, I wish I was inspired by something, you know, but for me, you've got to go out and find your inspiration. Um, you know, for me, I'm inspired by little things, by a sunset or like by walking the dogs in the forest in the evening, for instance, like things like that inspire me, you know, like just being out in nature inspires me to work. And then again, like going to galleries and seeing different paintings and seeing artists that you love. Um, and watching documentaries there's there's lots of ways to find inspiration but it's not just gonna it's not just gonna fall into your lap it's something that you actually have to go out and search for do you ever think about like changing what you paint say moving from animals to i don't know say humans or, or something else yeah i mean i have thought of it in the past but like i'm so passionate about animals like People often say, oh, don't you get bored of painting a the same a leopard or a lion? But, you know, to be honest, every single painting is different to me. Like each painting has its own unique challenges and its own unique characters. And like, I just, I, I, I don't know why, but I, even to this day, I just don't get bored of it. It's just something that I'm absolutely inspired to do. And I'm, I'm passionate about it. You know, that passion is something that just gets stronger and stronger. It hasn't, it hasn't died as I've gotten older. It's just... As with as it's just getting stronger and stronger with every painting, I think. You're probably making a lot of people jealous, uh, because you know, not many people I, I think are like inspired by necessarily what they do. They kind of wake up and they're like, Yeah, I can't wait to work today. But it seems like you've got to yeah. this this point in your life now. Um you, you obviously, you know, this is like a full-time gig for you now. You you're making like a, a living, like and you're doing extremely well. Um, how did that come about? And like, yeah, you know, how did that come about? It's sort of that. Yeah, yeah. So um, I am really lucky to be honest. Like, uh, you know, like it's really difficult. It's really easy to forget the position that you're in. And I've got to just, luckily, my wife sort of reminds me 
she's like, you know, you're really lucky to be able to do what you do. So I'm really grateful to that. Basically what happened was um, whilst I was living in Switzerland, I came over and I did a show in Windsor um, at an art fair. And at the art fair, um, a lady came up to me and she said, oh, I represent this company called uh, Clarendon Fine Art. And would you be interested in becoming one of the artists? And I was like, yeah, I, I sort of knew who they were um, from living in the UK. I had sort of an idea of who they were. And I was like, yeah, maybe I'm just, I don't think I'm ready for that commitment yet, you know? So I went back to Switzerland and like, I just sort of put it aside and every now and then I'd hear back from them saying, oh, are you ready to join? And I'd be like, oh, I just felt like I just wasn't ready for it. You know, I didn't feel like my art was at the right point, which it actually was. I don't know. I think I was just scared of taking the leap. And um, so I moved back to the UK and they got in contact with me again. I said, you know what? I'm just going to take a chance and just see what happens with this. And um, yeah, basically sent them some paintings and they invited me over to their headquarters and I had a meeting with them and I signed on as one of their artists. And this company called Clarendon Fine Art is like, it is the biggest publishing company in the world. So they've got massive clout and basically they said to me, right, all you have to do is paint and we'll take over everything else. So they do the marketing and the whole sort of business aspect of being an artist. I don't have to worry about that anymore. So that's my only issue is to paint and get as many paintings done as possible. And to be honest with you, like I've, it was probably the best, well, it was the best decision I've ever made because the company itself is absolutely brilliant. And I just, they're so professional about their, the way they hold exhibitions. Um, and they've just literally transformed my life. Literally, it's been an absolute blessing to be with them. And I just never knew, you know, I was so scared of taking that leap of handing over everything to someone else. I, cause, because I'm quite a control freak. I didn't, I didn't want to hand control over it to anyone or anything, especially when it comes to art. And um, yeah, just handing over the control to them has just changed my life. So they don't like tell you what you have to paint or how much you have to paint or, or are there any kind of like rules around that? No, they've, I've got free reign. I mean, they, they sort of give me an indication of like, like what they have in stock and what people are asking for, um, like, like um, for the exhibitions and stuff. Like I know I'm going on an exhibition. I've got one next year in January and they've asked for elephants. So I've got to be painting lots of elephants up until then. Um, but yeah, they sort of give me an indication, but I'm actually free to do whatever I want, really, which is, it's, it's incredible. You know, really, really, it's an amazing position to be in. And I've just sort of got to pinch myself every now and then to realize that I'm really lucky to have made it to this point. Hmm. That's amazing, bud. So you don't like ever feel like you have your, your hands tied and you have to like just stay there, like, I don't know, yeah. No, I mean, I'm, I'm contracted with them. Like I don't sell work to anyone else. Like it's only for them, but I'm completely happy with that. You know, they've taken out the, the sort of like stress of getting your art out there and trying to sell it, you know, like it's, it's just been a real sort of like turnaround for me. I mean, don't get me wrong. I really enjoyed doing my own exhibitions and taking part in the art fairs and what have you, but to have that element taken over by a professional company or professional gallery it's just made such a big difference. And I can imagine like the introductions and, and stuff like that uh, are like pay for themselves effectively, don't they? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like with the exhibitions, like I'll go, I've got one at the end of this month in Weybridge and what will happen is I'll go there and I've got like, I've got to do like a live painting demonstration. So I'll do something for the day with paints and then you'll have like the people that come into the gallery and they'll come and drink wine and come and meet the artist. And it's just really cool, you know? I mean, that's, a, that's such a cool side of, that's where, that's where I think the social side of being an artist comes in is doing these exhibitions. Do you ever like feel like you, you want to teach people art? Uh, yes, but I, don't, I don't know. I don't know if I have the patience for it, to be honest. Um, I mean, I'm happy to give people tips and like, look at the art and say, I can tell them like, oh, maybe try this and make it a bit better, you know? But I just don't think I have the patience to teach. I mean, I have patience when it comes to painting and that's about it. <laughs> but I, I totally, I totally get it. But you're <laughs> like, once you are like 
I guess at a certain level and you, you're doing what you want to do, you're like in your elements, then yeah, having to um, maybe sort of teach people um, unless it's like really this fire burning in you, then it's uh, then it's something difficult to yeah. do. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love, I love it when people like message me on Instagram or social media and they send me some pictures of their art and they're like, Oh, what do you think I should do to like make it a bit better? And I can look at it and I can say, Oh, why didn't you try that? I'm happy. I really enjoy seeing the changes in the painting after I've given them some advice. But yeah, I think that's the extent of my teaching ability. <laughs> <laughs> Classic, but um, so but as we sort of like uh, sort of start sort of winding things up, um, I was wondering like, what what are you like most excited about um for the future in terms of like your art and uh, where that's going and um, things around that? Yeah, I think for me it's just you know in my head I've got a, I've got in my head of how I want my art to look, you know, I've got this dream of a certain sort of like ability and it's just that journey to get into that point. You know, I have, I don't feel I've reached that point yet. And I'm excited to one day look at my art and think, you know what, I've hit that point. I've hit that sort of technical ability that I've been dreaming about my whole life, really. Um, and yeah, it's just, I'm excited about upcoming exhibitions and just seeing where the art takes you. You know, my whole life has just been, I've always just seen where my art takes me and, you know, like taking the opportunities when they arrive, you know, just grabbing them and just being able to just put the trust in your art for it to deliver. Is there going to be like a moment for you when you go, cool, I've made it like, or, or kind of, do you feel like that already? Uh, I don't feel like that. No, no, not at all. I feel like there's such a long way to go still. Um, you know what, I don't think there, there will be because if I look at my work now compared to when I was a youngster, I, would, I mean, I, I would look at, I know for a fact that if I was a kid and I saw my work now, I'd be like, wow, that's really good. Um, but I don't feel I'm at that level that I want to be, you know, there's so much more that I can learn. And I think that's the thing with art. It's just something that you can never master. There's always going to be areas to grow. And that's the part that I love about it the most is just the just the challenges that it, that, it, that it brings in front of you with each new subject and the, and the chance to grow with it. But for me, like, I find it almost impossible for you to think that your art could get better. Like I was, I was like, I was looking at one of the, the lion ones yesterday and I'm like, my goodness, that is like picture perfect, you know? And like, so, so what sort of things yeah. <laughs> do you think you can like get better at and improve at? Um, oh, there's so many things there. There's like technical things. There's like real, I can go into the real sort of technical aspects of like brush application and, and, the, and the sort of like amount of brush strokes that you use to create a painting. Like ideally in an ideal world, I want to create the same sort of a painting, but with less brush strokes. That's sort of like my main thing was like, because at the moment I've used so many brush strokes, but I want to try and achieve the same thing with less brush strokes. Um, and it's really difficult. I know it sounds crazy, but it's a really difficult thing to do. And for me, that's all about understanding color and, and color theory. That's the most important thing, I think, to get that to that point. And it's something that I haven't mastered. That's so classic. You've spoken a lot about color, actually. And um, you know, maybe just like, just touch a little bit on that. Like what, what is it about color that's so important? It creates atmosphere, it creates feelings. Like color is more important than the actual subject itself. Like you can, pa you can paint anything. You've got to understand complementary colors and how they work when you put two colors against each other and how that can make something appear three-dimensional or make something appear really flat, you know? Um, art is mostly about color. In fact, color is the most important thing. Oh, it's like you need to, to really understand a good painting. You need to be able to understand how to apply colors correctly. And um, I love color. I love sort of blues and yellows when they're put next to each other. I love sort of like having like a really like cold sort of like purpley color. And then you have like an orange next to it. And it just the sort of vibe thing 
vibrating effect that they have next to each other. It just, it, it makes the paintings come alive. It's absolutely fascinating. Have there been any... And you don't, like... you don't see... The... Sorry, you don't, you don't see these things on a painting when you stand up, when you stand far away from it. But if you go to my paintings and look really closely, you'll see that, that I don't really like try and paint every single hair. It's actually more about the colors. Wow, it's really fascinating. But have there been any like amazing artists that were colorblind? Not that I'm, I'm they probably are. There's one, I think. Um, oh gosh, I can't remember his name now. Um, he was a realist, realism artist. Um, he used to paint like these portraits, these massive portraits. Oh gosh, I'm his name's forgotten. I've forgotten his name. Too embarrassed about that. But he paint these like massive portraits um, in sort of like abstract circles, if you know what I mean. And when you looked at them really closely, it would just be like this abstract sort of thing. But if you step back, it would be like a, a super realistic portrait. It was amazing. But he was colorblind. Um, yeah, I definitely think there are artists that have been colorblind. Definitely. Hmm. So interesting that, that you said that. I'm going to definitely look at paintings differently now that uh, that you've had this sort of conversation. But so, where can um, people get in uh, touch with you if they, um, you know, they want to sort of touch base um, or you know yeah. buy your work or anything like that? I mean, the best place is just to contact me on Instagram. Um, I, I, I answer all messages that I get on there or Facebook. Um, you can look me up on my uh, gallery representation, which is Clarendon Fine Art. And I mean, they've got exhibitions all over the place. So I've got, like I said, I've got one in Weybridge at the end of this month. And then I've got another exhibition on a cruise ship at the end of January. So yeah, there's, there's always things going on. Exciting times, but exciting times. So my last question is, but what yeah. does being ridiculously human mean to you? What does ridiculously being human, gosh? For me, it's about being passionate, you know, and just pursuing your, your, your passions and your goals and sticking to it no matter what life throws at you, you know. Just do it every day and do it to the best of your ability no matter what it is. Just stick to it. You know, there's going to be times when things get in the way, but if you stick to it and you believe in what you're doing, you will succeed. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I, and I really like that. You know, it's a good reminder for, for people just to sort of keep going because um, the, yeah, the benefits of keeping going are much more than, than stopping and, and sort of giving up early. So yeah, I, just, I just wanted to say, Seriously, man, it's been a total like honor to to speak to you today, um, and have you as a guest on the on the podcast. Uh, you, you obviously are just amazing at what you do, you know. And you, I, I can see, like you, you know, you didn't even go into like half of the detail of like what it sort of takes to do what you do, you know. Um, and I, I just like, yes, I'm just like so amazed that. Um, how you manage to paint what you paint, you know, like, and, and you, you do it day in, day out. You've got this really like awesome attitude, um, approach to life. Um, there's lots of kind of lessons in there for, for everyone to kind of apply to like whatever they do in their, in their life, you know? And, uh, yeah, yeah just thanks, man. It's, it's, I, I really look forward to seeing you in person, but, and, and having a, having a jug of coffee with you, yeah. but because, uh, <laughs> yeah, sounds like we both got a love of it. Yeah, so yeah. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you too, Gareth. It's been amazing. It's been really cool. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about everything, really. It's been absolutely a pleasure.